The stretch of 185 miles country from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, is one of the most fascinating and picturesque in the nation, a wilderness area where we can commune with God and nature, a place not yet marred by the roar of wheels and the sound of horns. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas said these words in 1954, sharing his love for the old Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. The canal stood little more than a muddy trench, with its existence threatened by the planned extension of the George Washington Parkway. Douglas, a dominating force in American politics for 40 years, set out to hike the entirety of the canal to raise awareness for his favorite getaway destination. But what was this old contraption that a leading public figure was crusading to defend? Let's explore the history of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal and the men and women who lived their lives along its 185 miles. I have now to perform the more pleasing task of exhibiting an imperfect sketch of the existing state of the unparalleled prosperity of the country. On a general survey, we behold cultivation extended, the arts flourishing, and the face of the country improved. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal was born out of American expansion. As the nation grew, the immense resources gained needed infrastructure to get to the factories of booming American industry. One more cog in the wheel of Speaker of the House Henry Clay's American system, the Sino Canal was nearly disregarded in the laissez-faire presidency of James Monroe. However, after years of negotiation, the canal was at last chartered in 1824. He told me that it was pretty rough going. Saturday was payday and he said that on Saturday night they all used to get drunk and take to fighting and sometimes the National Guard would have to come to quieten down. Otto Swain. Construction of the canal began on July 4th, 1828, with President John Quincy Adams symbolically breaking ground. Though originally designed to reach the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, limited funding and engineering practicality set the final destination at Cumberland, Maryland. 35,000 laborers spent 22 years constructing the full canal. As impressive a feat as this was, the very foundation of the canal was built on shaky soil. The same day that construction of the canal began, work started on the building of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The canal was caught on the wrong side of progress and would forever be overshadowed by its similarly named rival. As construction of the canal ended, its period of prosperity began. Though operations started long before the canal was fully completed, the canal's success exploded once it ran in its entirety. Boats floated massive amounts of coal and other resources from Cumberland down to Washington, D.C., while towns along the canal, such as Georgetown and Great Falls, grew rapidly. However, flooding in 1852 and 1857, coinciding with economic downturns, shed light on a grim future to come. But for the time being, the canal turned a profit though the dark storm clouds of civil war rose on the horizon. Before New Year's, General Jackson made several trips to Dam No. 5 on the Potomac for the purpose of destroying it, and thereby impairing the efficiency of the Cedo Canal. Henry Kidd Douglas The canal became a point of contention as the Civil War broke out. Early on, Confederate cavalry repeatedly crossed the river to burn boats, damage locks, and steal horses. During the Antietam campaign, Robert E. Lee ordered the Monocacy Aqueduct destroyed, an operation which failed due to a lack of equipment. These threats led to the permanent garrison of Yankee soldiers and artillery along the canal. Though the loss of business early in the war proved costly, the canal company reaped the benefits of Union success as the war ended, and in the ensuing post-war boom, saw its traffic soar and debts slide off its ledgers. The canal's great success lasted until 1873. In that year, floods swept through the canal, this time coinciding with the largest economic depression 
in 30 years. The company remained profitable, but more and more clients moved their cargo onto rails. As the Depression dragged on, demand for the coal that the canal shipped dropped, leading to strikes and severe budget cuts. 1877 saw an even larger flood than four years prior, and it was all but a miracle that the canal stayed open. Droughts and strikes followed, which brought the canal to its knees. At last, a catastrophic flood in 1889 pushed the canal into insolvency, and was kept operating on the whim of the B&O Railroad, for no other reason than to keep it from falling into a competitor's hands. The canal would operate for 35 years after the Great Flood of 1889, but its glory days had ended. From a historical perspective, the canal was a small footnote in the American epic, but for those running the boats and locks of the canal, it was everything. Let's jump to the year 1916 and journey from Cumberland to Georgetown along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal and delve into the marvelous lives of the people who lived along its banks. This was Captain Samuel Spong, boat number 74, a small boat, the Windship. Our journey into the life along the CNO Canal will follow Samuel Spong, an ordinary captain. Spong traveled with his wife and four kids. The beginning of any trip down the canal was Cumberland. Never a large town, Cumberland nevertheless served as the connecting point between the resources of Appalachia and the markets of Georgetown. A canal boat would be filled to the brim with freight, mostly coal, and the soft currents of the canal would glide it out of Cumberland. Mules were used to maintain sufficient speed, often driven by young boys. A solid pace would have the boat tethered in Sharpsburg by nightfall. The bunks didn't sleep too good because all you had was straw tick in the bunk. That's all. That wasn't too good. I never knew anybody having a mattress. J.P. Mose. Nights were tough on the canal. After a hard day's work, a boatman could not look forward to the comforts of a mattress. Only a bunk lined with straw. The air was thick and humid, and the sleeping quarters were tight to say the least. The oppressive Maryland summers made spending the night in a tavern just marginally more accommodating. Some boats kept going through the night, with crews taking shifts to stay rested. The chains were long enough to allow considerable movement, but not long enough for any chance of falling overboard. Elizabeth Keitel Children from infanthood were present on the canal. When too young to help, they spent their days on the decks of the canal boats, since the cabin air at midday was dangerously hot. Tying them to the boat, as dehumanizing as it sounds, was a critical practice that saved young children from drowning in the canal. Once they were old enough, about nine, the boys worked as mule drivers, and the girls helped their mothers with cleaning and cooking. Provided that an adequate pace was kept, a load of coal could be moved from Cumberland to Georgetown in a week. Once the journey was over, it was time to turn around and head home. Captain Spong dropped off his freight and headed back up the canal. Spong would make it home, but the same could not be said for his family. They locked out in the river at Rock Creek, and the wind ship took them up to the powerhouse. There was a concrete wall where the boats pulled up, and a pipe came out of the wall for blowing the boiler off. All that steam forced right into the boat, straight into the cabin. The undertaker from Sharpsburg came up for the three children, and took them to Sharpsburg and buried them. Captain Spong never boated again after that. J.P. Mose. The death of Spong's children was emblematic of the fall of the canal. In 1924, a catastrophic flood tore through the Potomac, ruining houses, stores, and boats, while rendering the canal damaged beyond repair. It sat for three decades, occasionally used for recreation, but never truly appreciated. Thanks to the work of William Douglas, the canal was taken in by the National Park Service, repaired, and turned into a massive park. Today, five million tourists a year visit the canal. Throughout its history, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal has survived intact, and its rich history and scenic majesty will forever stand a shining example of human innovation, willpower, and resilience. I ain't got no whiskey, but I will have some honey. 
Uh-huh. I ain't got no whiskey, but I will have some when this boat gets to Washington. It's a honey, oh darling of mine. 